Well, thanks. It is a very happy moment for us to have Professor Epi Baltanan visiting us once more. He visited a couple of years back when he organized a conference, which of course was some national level with Amita Walaini, myself, <coughs> on gravity and different aspects of it. So he visited. And we are very proud to have him here again once more because of this. Next week, we are going to organize a conference on non commuted geometry, mathematical and physical implications on quantum space time and matter. So, as you know, Professor Balchandran is very, very well known. He is a non resident Indian physicist from Syracuse University. He is there from 62 or 63. And he has done enormous amount of work covering different aspects of particle physics, quantum field theory, particularly topological aspects like solitons, institutons, and various other things. Carmians, for example, he has made very well known contributions in these directions. Also, he is an expert in non commutative geometry, particularly in the formulation of quantum field theory in background non commutative space time. And the symmetry aspects of it, which are captured by Hoff algebra essentially. He has also studied basic aspects of, say, entanglement. Today, he is, in fact, going to talk about these things, this subject. And he has tackled the problem of how to capture the entanglement aspects, even for identical particles, which, by because of their basic symmetric or anti-symmetric nature, by default, entangled because you cannot write them just like direct product. So how to quantify these things? These are the questions which has been addressed in the literature but not to complete satisfaction. Professor Balchandran has made a very deep contribution in these aspects and today we are really, it is a coincidental somehow that Professor Fedeli Lizzi, who happens to be also, he is one of his very prominent students in present among our meets. So I, before I invite our director to say a few words, I request Professor Fadel Lizzi to say a few words about Professor Balchandra. Because he knows okay. him from long time and is the one who well, yes. prominent student. Well, it's a pleasure to the perspective of a student at my age. It's always a, a pleasure. You know, there are uh, lots of places, when, when you visit places, uh, there are uh, sh shrines and national monuments. There are important places. Now, Balachandran has had several dozen students. I don't remember the count, I, 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 but the, the, we must be something like 40. Wherever you go, there is one. Kumar Gupta is there, as my colleague has him, as myself. And uh, we all think that there should be a national monument in Syracuse, which is the Room 316. Because the scientific activity of Bal has been done everywhere in the world, but the, like the itinerant clerics, there is always a shrine, a place, and this was this room 316. And I want really to acknowledge to his way of doing physics is uh, sitting down with people and constantly talk and talk and talk and talk with a blackboard, of course. Uh, at some point, he got a little bit older, so the students were going on the blackboard. And when I was there, he was still in his 40s, and so he was jumping up and down the blackboard, and uh, we were all there, sometimes fighting over the blackboard. And uh, uh, it's really a pleasure, since I'm a student, and now he says that I'm an eminent, but that's uh, uh, something, but really to give this uh, testimony, this witnessing of this uh, characteristic of Val, which is really, it's, uh, extreme energy and pleasure. Now he's uh, a little bit older than 40, but uh, just a factor, of, a, a mere factor of two. And uh, you will see that uh, he still loves to do this kind of uh, things, discussing and doing physics. So I think I am the director for the more so official things, this was a more personal thing. But, uh, so I just, before I invite our director, Professor Shamit Pondre, I just want to tell you, yeah, this is also coincidental that Professor Balchandran, in this 125th year of Bosch anniversary, Essen Bosch anniversary <coughs> celebration, Professor Balchandran also has completed 80 years. In fact, he was, uh, his birthday was celebrated in Dublin, in so advanced study prestige, and I was, <laughs> had the privilege to get an invitation from Balchandran himself to attend it. It was a very humble experience for me. So, 
you can recognize that uh, there is a huge gathering of scientists from all over the world who celebrated his contributions and reminiscenced about his days in Syracuse and elsewhere. In the, he travels actually all throughout the world. He's a globe trotter, so to say. So his wave function is completely delocalized. And you don't know at a moment where he is sending you email from or why he is talking to you through Skype. <coughs> so anyway, so before I say anything else, I just hand it over to our director, Professor Shavu, to address a few words. I think you have heard about Professor Banchandran from two of his eminent students, of course, both of you. And so I don't have much, nothing to add, add here. So the only thing I welcome you on behalf of the center, particularly this will be 12 to 125 distinct this lecture. Thank you. So we are extremely happy that you have agreed to give this distinct this lecture and spend some time in our institutes. I am sure that our students will be immensely benefited. And two conferences will be there, so I am sure that the audience of the conference is really highly benefited by your With that, I welcome you here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 I feel uh, awkward. Okay. I'm very flattered to have been invited for this meeting to, ask, to give this lecture. I am not sure if I'm adequate to deal with it, and I, uh, so I'll try my best. I'm glad to see that most of the people in the audience are physicists. One of my diff hesitations after I prepared this talk was whether I was uh, becoming too technical. So I'll try to compensate for it, but. If you have questions, please ask me. It also is a matter of pleasure for me to see my students here. I see Kumar here. Kumar has been a long-standing collaborator of mine. She was a Syracuse student. Then Fedele, who talked a minute ago. And there is one more, Lahiri. Amita was a student at Syracuse too. There are, not here, but elsewhere, for example, in Bangalore, Sachin, like was the, Sachin was my student. No, no, I'm there. Amita was student of Mark Bowie. Yeah, I know. Amita was student of Mark Bowie. Then Sachin Vaidya in Bengaluru, and then there is of course Ajit <laughs> Ajit Mohan Srivastava, who, who is now in Bhubaneswar. And uh, so it has been. A, a good experience for me that I have been invited. And Vishwajit was re remembered me to, to uh, give this talk here. Okay. So uh, I want to re remember before I start some of the uh, thoughts that went through about Sachin Bose. Okay. From what I gathered by talking to people, by looking at the history of uh, Sachin Bose, what I found was that. Both belong to what I may call as the renaissance of science in uh, Bengal, starting around 1870 and ending around 1950 or so. In this period, you found three, at least three, very famous names. One was J.C. Bose, who was the senior most of all the three, and they were followed by Meghna Sagar and by Satin Bose. Okay. Now, from what I understand, Jagdish Chandra Bose was an extraordinary person. He was a polymath who knew many, many things. Okay. From what I read, he was a physicist, a biologist, a biophysicist, a botanist, and an archaeologist. And also, he wrote science fiction. Okay. Among the earliest science fiction, perhaps the first person to write science fiction in Bengali was he. Okay. It is also uh, fairly acknowledged now that he discovered wireless telegraphy before Marconi did. Uh, his son, from what I understand from Bishuji, came here and acknowledged this fact. And this has also been acknowledged in high Kipling. But he himself never bothered to establish his credentials. So he, he was very accomplished. And he also trained 
the two people, namely Meghna Saha and uh, Satyan Ghosh. And Meghna Saha, he himself was a very, very accomplished, distinguished astrophysicist. Okay? And the leading figure in modern, in build, in especially was his contribution in building modern Indian science, where which he, in which he participated with Homi Baba. Uh, apparently, uh, the Tata uh, their styles were very different. There were conflicts between them. Okay? Uh, in any either case, what has come out of their efforts have been very significant for the creation of. Science in India as we know it today. Okay. Um, we know that Ham, ba, Bhumi, Baba's uh, contributions in TAFR, and especially I would say at that time, the efforts of mathematicians in, um, uh, in the Tata Institute has created a stellar group of people in India who have, uh, were flourishing like anything in the, world, in the world of mathematics. And in physics too, the consequences have been very tremendous. Okay. Uh, Saha's best known work concerned work in thermal ionization of elements okay? and it led him to formulate what is known today as the Saha equation for ionization and it is one of the basic tools for understanding stars and their radiation, okay? the spectra of stars in astrophysics. Okay? Now I understand that Bose and Saha were students of J.C. Bose. Okay? So uh, the lineage has continued that way and uh, you know, both in, in terms of Bose's contribution, they are in extremely fundamental <coughs> physics. Okay? He himself was not aware of the consequences of what he was doing. Okay? He was teaching at in Dhaka, at the University of Dhaka, in 1924, when he developed the statistics of identical particles, namely the dose of photons. Okay? The uh, way he, uh, in order to, uh, in order to formulate the statistical mechanics of photons, the way he did counting <coughs> for identical particles was completely novel okay? and has had consequences which are, which are very deep in, uh, in all of quantum mechanics and in fact all of physics I would say. Uh, the way he did the calculation, it has, it has absolutely no classical counterpart for identical particles okay? and the both statistics which has emerged from it has had consequences uh, all the way from uh, astrophysics, the, from the cosmic microwave background, all the way down to the lowest temperatures, including Bose, Bose condensation. Okay. Now, it also has had uh, offshoots in the form of fermi Dirac statistics. Uh, the stipulation that uh, the notion of examining identical particle statistics, which it received from Bose statistics, first went to fermi Dirac statistics, which has had very strong consequences for example, for magnet, all of magnetism is based on Fermi Dirac statistics. In fact, the stability of matter is based on Fermi Dirac statistics. And if I remember, if, I, uh, if you know, you may know the fact that if atoms are very vastly separated, so that our, our fingers are <coughs> mostly empty space, then natural question to ask is, why can't I cross one finger right through the other? Like some guru <coughs> in, uh, in India, okay, who can disappear from here and reappear there. Why don't I cross? Okay? And that is because of Fermi Dirac statistics, because identical particles cannot, identical fermions, spin half particles cannot occupy the same spot. Okay? So, from the most elementary gross features to uh, much of statistical mechanics and low temperatures, Fermi Dirac and Bose statistics have had a very strong influence. It has also seeped into mathematics. For example, it has led to the notion of uh, fractional statistics and braid statistics. I see that uh, one of the Baumic here, this off algebras. So there the notion of braid statistics plays a very important role, uh, which is a generalized uh, notion of statistics, which plays a role in what they call off algebras. And if you see the lineage of this one, it goes back to both what both did at that time in 1924. Okay. I should add furthermore that many of our careers have been based on this. Okay. For example, I think that uh, Kumar and I have published many papers on uh, issues related to statistics and for sure my promotion at Syracuse has been based on what I was doing with Rafael Sorkin and others on identity particles. Okay. So it has had consequences also at a personal level. Okay. 
uh, Bose received many honors. Okay. Uh, along with Bose and Saha, he was several, nominated several times for the Nobel Prize, which he, whatever the reason, he did not make it, but never, never mind. Okay. He also uh, took an active part in the development of Indian, Indian science and took an active part in the Indian physics community and had <coughs> important roles in the Indian Statistical Institute, okay, in the CSIR, uh, the Indian Science Congress, and the Indian Physical Society. And of all things, at, for some time, he was also a member of the Rajya Sabha, which is, uh, which is something I did not know until I did little investigation. Now, my talk here will also touch upon identical factors. Okay? From the point of view of uh, how uh, uh, Jit was mentioning, okay? how, well, how the impact of identity of particles uh, affects quantum information theory. I see somebody who works on that field here. And how it affects entropy. Okay? I will touch upon it here when I, I talk about it. Okay? And I will also tell some reasons regarding why entropy increases. Under certain circumstances, the increase in the entropy is a very, as time evolves, it's a very natural phenomenon. It, it will, in, the tendency for entropy is to increase. And it is purely because of some mathematical property, which I'll try to explain as I keep going. Okay? So this is by way of introduction. Now I, I come back to the Polokian per se. And I want to start by, <coughs> so at some point later, I'll become somewhat technical. Please forgive me for this. Okay. Uh, maybe I could have simplified it. Many features which are very attractive. Okay. So in the algebraic formulation, the notion of space and time are emergent concepts. Okay. The algebra, algebra of operators is what is more fundamental. And I want to tell by way, by way of intersection how we end up there. So we, let us start with classical physics. And we, let us remember that no matter what you do in classical physics, there are two aspects. One is that we are measuring an ensemble, yeah. maybe some collection of uh, uh, atoms okay, inside a box, but going undergoing collisions. Okay. And, uh, the, that ob system we are observing okay, is described by some prob prob probability distribution density, let us call it rho. Okay. It may tell you how many uh, how many of these say atoms are in per unit volume. Okay. What is the probability rho of finding n one particle in some volume? Let us say. Okay. The second is the observable, the experiment I am doing to on that system. Okay. For example, it could be a fun some function f, like for, for example, the charge density on that phase space. Neither of them, these are two separate objects, they are not subject, they are not directly subject to experiments, but their pairing is subject to the experiments, because the result of an experiment is the mean value of f given by integrating rho with f, dq dp, and that gives you the mean value of f. f. This is the uh, rudimentary formulation of the, uh, 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 I should say, the epistemology of classical mechanics. The same is the case in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics also we have a state of the system being observed. For example, in, in the LSE, in the ring, you have uh, protons going round and round the ring. Okay. So the, pro the object uh, the object is state of the photon, this is what I am talking about. We, even without our looking, the protons are going around and that is what, where I am going to do my measurement. Then, we have an observable alpha being measured. In quantum mechanics, the alpha is some operator, but the observable alpha is what the, uh, it will, will be measured on the state and the outcome of that uh, pairing is what we, what is, what we uh, eventually register on our counter. So in elementary quantum mechanics, the way we describe the state is by a wave function or a vector h in a Hilbert space h. Okay. The observable alpha is an operator on a Hilbert space. The outcome of the, outcome of the experiment is the mean value of alpha, which is given by this equation, psi alpha psi. 
But there is some, this is what, how quantum mechanics is normally taught in class, in elementary textbooks. But there is something uh, un, unsatisfactory in this aspect. Because this, the whole thing looks like contrived, because in classical mechanics, there is no notion of the Hilbert space. Okay. There is a further problem. You notice that the mean value of alpha, which is what the experiment gives you, is independent of the face of the side. So if you replace side by, what is it? Yeah. So replace side by side times a face, okay. the mean value is un unaltered because the face cancels out when I take this expectation value. So psi and uh, exponential i alpha, i epsilon psi, will gives you, gives you the same density matrix, so this expression is unchanged. Okay. So in classical mechanics, there is no such feature that you encounter. We may think that this is a trivial statement. But already in 1931, Dirac noticed that this has profound consequences. In fact, that paper is a very remarkable paper. Okay. <coughs> uh, it is still very much worth reading. And it was because he noticed that there are instances where <coughs> this phase ambiguity we are talking about. Yeah. The phase ambiguity I am talking about, where is it? Where should I? I should point here. Huh? Okay. The phase ambiguity I am talking about, this phase ambiguity I am talking about, okay, has very profound consequences in quantum mechanics. In this paper that he wrote in 1931, okay. But I don't know where it is. And he noticed that because of this phase ambiguity and this particular properties, there is some. He noticed that this phase ambiguity has some topological features, and he noticed that it, the existence of these topological features is exactly what leads you, what leads you to magnetic monopoles. Okay. So this is a very remarkable paper where he proved that if magnetic monopole has magnetic charge G. Okay, because of the phase ambiguity, he proved that they can be, there can be such an object. But then he also proved that E times G is an integer. In the same paper, you find the argument that E times G is an integer. E times G over 4 pi is an integer. Okay. So this will mean by just by looking at this equation, that electric charge is quantized. For example, you fix G to some G zero, then electric charge all the electric charges E G over 4 pi is an integer. So all, that means that E <coughs> over 4 pi is integer over G0. Okay. So electric charge will be quantized. So will the magnetic charge is B. So he pointed out this fact around this time. It is very remarkable that at the same time in mathematics, <coughs> the notion of fiber bodies was being simultaneously developed in uh, many places. I believe the main figures who were involved in are names like steam rod and so forth, but I am not sure of the history. But this uh, line of development was getting developed, developed in mathematics too. So they were uh, doing these things uh, s s parallelly, but not. Uh, they did not know each other. Let me say, uh, the physicists were quite unaware of the mathematics work until around, I would say, in the 70s, until 70s, when some work uh, began to appear in physics by people like Etoff, who found similar features in quantum field theory, and then uh, some people made the connection between the mathematics developments and physics developments. <laughs> Especially mathematicians who were interested in phys physical aspects like Athiya. Now, in the same year, or beginner, just to indicate to you the, the difference between physics uh, this uh, subtle difference between classical and quantum mechanics, beginner on symmetries okay, uh, showed that the symmetry which leaves this density matrix invariant can be, uh, when you try to replace it, uh, try to see what how it acts on the wave functions, it can be not a unitary operator, but an anti-unitary operator. 
In fact, time reversal is one such thing. CPT operation, which says that particles, antiparticle, lifetimes and masses are equal, uh, which are, are both dependent on the CPT, and they are anti-unitary operators on the full Hilbert space. Okay? So it's a, this is a sharp difference between what we would expect uh, about the behavior of rho, okay, classically, which is some transformation on rho, but if you try to write it on H, it becomes an anti-unitary operator. This, is a, this requires some analysis, some epistemological analysis of the meaning of symmetry, which we did. In 1939, he came up with <coughs> an even more strange result. Okay. He showed that when you make a 2 pi rotation, uh, he showed that the wave function can change sign. Okay. And that allows the existence of spin half. We should realize that spin half is not a natural concept in classical mechanics. Okay. Because a spin half in quantum mechanics is that if you make a 2 pi rotation of the system, it changes sign. But you should also realize the 2 pi rotation is doing nothing. Is uh, my standing here and gradually rotating like this and coming back to my original situation. And why should it do anything to the wave function? But the fact is that the ambiguity in representing a density matrix in terms of the wave function allows this possibility. And Wigner, in fact, showed that this actually happens. Okay? And this minus sign is what leads to you, leads you to the exclusion principle. And this phenomenon I showed you, why fingers don't cross. Or the phenomenon of magneti magnetism, okay? all the features we find in magnetism in condensed matter systems. Or many other, or <coughs> fermi-direct statistics and uh, kind of field fermi levels and things of this kind are related to this kind. Okay. Now, there were, it's, all this suggests that we should be able to make a, maybe we can make a formulation which is closer to quantum formulation, which is closer to, class, uh, to the classical situation. Okay. So, at least the suggestion is there that maybe I can do something different, more close to classical mechanics by formulating quantum theory in terms of a state omega on, on an algebra of observables. Algebra means I can multiply them. Okay. <coughs> so, the algebra could be, if x set quantum mechanically, could be x set is a position operator and p and the momentum operator, could be operated or operated as like exponential i p x hat, exponential i x p hat, the linear combination, the products, and so forth. And maybe I can formulate uh, a new new way of formulating quantum mechanics by giving a state on this algebra. So, so the state omega describes the objective system, and A is what I am measuring. So what do you need of A? The state is assigning a probability to an observation. So if I try to observe one, this is meaning that I, I accept anything at all in the in the is, instrument which I am measuring. It should give the total total probability, or omega at one should be the number one. Okay. So the, the, this is a statement that the total probability is one. Since it, since it is a probability, if I take a positive operator like alpha star alpha, star is like Hermitian conjugation. So there is some notion of a Hermitian conjugation here. So alpha star alpha, if I evaluate omega, should be non-negative. Okay. So star is equal to Hermitian conjugation. So it could be, for example, that omega of alpha is trace of O alpha. If I can uh, formulate all of quantum mechanics in this way, okay, in terms of omega and operators, it will look closer to classical physics. And it may be less mysterious to somebody starting with quantum mechanics. But then we are puzzled. So in this way of saying it, the only difference between classical and quantum physics is the following. Okay. Classically observables be functions commute. Uh, a function on phase space and another function on phase space, the order in which you multiply them doesn't matter. So it, they are commutative algebra. Whereas in quantum mechanics, 
the observables do not commute. Okay. So you would say that quantum physics is non-commutative probability theory. The only difference between classical and quantum mechanics is classical uh, physics is based on standard probability theory, whereas quantum physics is based on non-commutative probability theory, and this is an essential difference. Okay, fine. But then we ask, where is the quantum Hilbert space? Uh, textbooks they teach you quantum mechanics using Hilbert spaces, but where is it in this formulation? So it is one of the great achievements of these three people, Gelfand, Neymark, and Siegel, okay, that they showed how, given this, given this pro, the probability, the state omega, which is a, like a density probability distribution on this algebra A, how you can reconstruct the Hilbert space acting on this Hilbert space and this algebra of observables acting on this Hilbert space like a position operator or a momentum operator operates in ordinary quantum mechanics. Okay. They showed how this relationship can be established. Okay. I want to describe to you here how that happens. Okay. Then maybe I will show you some quantum ambiguities. This has implications. This construction has implications for entropy. I'll spend a few minutes on entropy and why it keeps increasing in certain processes. Okay. Uh, it is not even dynamic, it just happens because of the certain properties of the definition of entropy. And it looks like the, this increase it looks like the second law. And if possible, I'll talk about this entanglement and phase transitions, but I'm not sure I will have the time. So, this work was done by with these people, Goizrajan okay. uh, in, in, in uh, my sense, Amilcar in Brasilia, no, Vas in Brasilia, Andres Reyes, who will be here, who is in Bogota, and Sachin Vaidya okay, at, uh, in IAS. <coughs> so, in various combinations, we did these papers. But anyway, the basic ideas are not ours. Okay. The core ideas are due to this Delphi Naimak and Siegel. Okay. And I want to tell how, why, how this construction goes okay. slowly. It is very easy. Okay. Uh, with anyone with some background in ordinary quantum mechanics can follow this. Okay. So let me tell what it is. So I want to construct, given a state omega on an algebra A, I want to construct a Hilbert space H omega. It depends on omega. And A acts as operators on H omega. This is my uh, my uh, A. So I, I will construct the Hilbert space by elements of A themselves. Okay. So I will label ket vectors by alpha, say beta, uh, where beta is an op operator. So I will simply construct this ket vector with labeled with beta, where beta is an element of the algebra. Likewise, alpha is a corresponding bra vector, where alpha is also an element of algebra. But if you give me such cats and bras, I should give a scalar, a scalar product. What do I do? Well, I will say that the scalar product of alpha with beta is omega acting on alpha star beta. Okay. This is an algebra, so I know how to take products. There is a star defined on A, so I know what this is. So I will say that the scalar product of alpha with beta is omega of alpha star beta. Now, I, there is some technical combination using without because of what they call null states, but let me, uh, for this colloquium, forget about it. So you don't have to worry about this till they that comes here. You can identify them with alpha themselves. So all, I have got here this ketten bras which I have given you, and I have to tell you how the algebra acts on this bras and gets. Forget about beta, alpha acting on this beta ket will be alpha times beta. That's it. Okay. The Hilbert space is constructed with this scalar product, product and alpha acting on this ket vector is alpha beta the corresponding ket. I'm finished. Okay. <coughs> so I have in a very simple way I have gone from omega and a to this construction here. Okay. 
there are some complications if there are not what they call null states, but they are not big complications and we can handle them uh, quite easily and if you have questions I can answer them also. Okay. So I will give you examples. So here also bra alpha ket beta is an element of H. Okay. It's the same. Okay. The only thing that you may uh, ask me, which is some technical combination, <coughs> is uh, how do I get position operators instead of this beta, for example? No? Okay. The Hilbert space here you get is what quantum information people call as purification of you are given an omega, which is like a density matrix. The density matrix is given by some psi psi or something like that. And you can ask what is the purification, where I can find a Hilbert space for that. <coughs> and the gelfer neimer siegel construction gives a canonical purification of that thing. And then if you want to recover standard thing where only position operators are there and so on, you have to do a little bit more work, not very much but a little bit more work. In fact, what the work is involved will be in the next couple of slides. Okay? It's quite easy. There is nothing much here. Okay. So let me give you an example. algebra to be 2 by 2 matrices. Okay. So this is the system of 1 qubit. If you do quantum information or people trying to do quantum, quantum information type things, this is, it is a, uh, uh, all the operator algebra of 1 qubit because it is a 2 dimensional with complex vector space. So two by, all 2 by 2 matrices cannot act on it. So this will be your algebra. I give you a state. It will depend on a parameter called lambda. So we have, I have enough of them in the picture. Okay. It is lambda lies between zero and one. Okay. And omega lambda on this alpha, I will give you a number. <coughs> and I will say that it is lambda times alpha one one plus one minus alpha lambda times alpha two. Okay. This is okay because if alpha is a unit matrix, then this will become one. If alpha is a unit matrix, this becomes 1, okay, obviously. And one can also check that, so the condition that omega lambda on 1 is okay. And you can also check that omega lambda of alpha star alpha is strictly positive. <coughs> because in fact alpha star alpha, omega lambda of alpha star alpha has a one entry, which is modulus of alpha 1 1 squared plus alpha 2 1 mod squared here and alpha 1 2 mod square plus alpha 2 2 mod square here. So this object is clearly positive because it is lambda times this element what comes here and 1 minus lambda times what, what comes here. So positivity is also okay. What is the Hilbert space? Hilbert space is given by this object here. So the scalar product will be beta with alpha will be omega or lambda of beta dagger alpha. You can calculate it. Okay. What is a representation of operators? This is more interesting. Look at beta acting on alpha. 
for example, it was cubic, for example, I want to flip the spins of the cubits. So what will happen is, so this could be spin up and this could be spin down. So beta alpha will be, beta is acting from the left. So I can write the alpha matrix as a sum of two matrices. And beta can act on the first column or on the second column. Or any beta acting on matrices of this kind won't produce entries in the last two, last two entries. Last two will always remain blank as zeros. Okay. Like we see here, the first two will always remain in blank as zeros. So the Hilbert space actually splits into two direct sums. First is this direct Hilbert space. The second is this Hilbert space. Okay. So if you want an irreducible system, you can keep just one of them and forget about the other. Okay. Suppose I don't want two copies of spin half, I will keep only one and throw it in a second. Okay. So the representation pi omega of A is a direct sum of two, namely pi omega 1 and plus pi omega 2. And finally I write the scalar product, alpha 1, alpha 1 is just this, it's clearly positive, so then this question is answer, there is a lambda here, lambda is between 0 and 1, so I cannot take lambda negative obviously also okay and the other one is 1 minus lambda times this object in case lambda is 0 <coughs> suppose i choose lambda to be 0 or lambda to be 1 then the if lambda is 0 all this these vectors will be null vectors you will have zero norm then you have to do some more work to get rid of it not much work but little work okay? likewise if lambda is 1 you have to do little work to get rid of this null vectors if you know quantum QED, okay, there is a so called Gupta Bloiler uh, procedure okay, for uh, uh, getting rid of null vectors. You have to apply some technique like that. Okay. So, here I have done, I produced for you the quantum mechanics of one qubit starting from the algebraic construction. <coughs> now, this construction shows some very strange features. And I, let me show you what those string features are. Sir, uh, these 2 uh, by 2 matrices, these are not density matrices, right? I mean, they are not density, they are ket vectors. Uh, but why it is uh, written in a matrix? I mean, it should be a column vector then. This should be, ah, you can, why should we, no, I can, uh, you are thinking that the wave function should always be a column. I mean, I am thinking that you are just uh, writing the density matrix the way we write that. This is not a density matrix, this is a vector. Ah, that way I understand, that. that's why, I mean, usually we do it, we write it in a column vector. Vector, but I write, now, write it now as a matrix. So for example, you take a, a spring half particle. Let me take, uh, take a quark, if you know about quarks, it has a two indices, one is qi, Q alpha i. There are two indices, no? So I can write it as a matrix, you know. So if there are multiple multiple indices, you can arrange them as a matrix. So if you like, I can I have arranged the things in a matrix form. Okay. There are more than one index. Okay. So which is running over some values. So it's convenient to write it as a matrix. <coughs> and the algebra of operators is given as a matrix. So this it is come out as matrices. So all these alpha 1, 1, alpha 2 and these are amplitude, probability amplitudes, not probability. No, no. This is describing for you the state of the, like a wave function, it is describes for you the wave function. Alpha here. Okay. All the alphas are uh, complex quantities. The alpha, alpha is a 2 by 2 complex matrices. Yeah. These two alphas are any 2, any 2 by 2 complex matrix. Yes. If you want to normalize it, you have to use the scalar product that I have given you, namely omega of uh, uh, omega lambda of alpha star alpha, and you should set it equal to 1. So that will give you a normalization condition. I think, I think you have to use this uh, operator vector correspondence that when a column vector can be referred to an operator, yeah. so, so you just take the, uh, I mean, uh, if, it is, uh, if the operator is aij uh, ket i bra j, then yeah. it can be represented as a vector. Uh, it will be a linear 
But here k alpha and k uh, this bra beta, bra beta, these are elements of the algebra. The algebra is playing a dual role. In this game, the algebra is playing a dual role. That's why I distinguish them when they are acting as <coughs> elements of Hilbert space, I put it within kets, as labels of kets. But when they act as operators, I put them outside. Okay? So, so they are playing a dual role. So they act as operators on acting on Acting on a Hilbert space. On a Hilbert space. So when they act as, <coughs> act as operators, you don't give the ket notation. No, I don't put the ket notation. And when you give the ket notation, then, then what happens? Then they, are then they are operators. And then, for example, here, beta acts on a ket. <coughs> beta is an operator. Alpha is a ket. The action is, I multiply beta with alpha, that is a well understood. Okay? And take the ket. So the image of the ket, this ket under the action of beta is this ket. Okay? So both operators and vectors are represented by matrices? Yes. By matrices. Matrices. But irreducibly, they become columns. <coughs> For example, uh, I gave you an example. The Hilbert space splits into direct sum of two. Each of these irreducible under the action of the operator, they don't change. It's like a degeneracy index. A de this and this are degenerate representations. Okay. So they split into two. Okay. And the, the scale of the norm here is like somewhat different from the norm here. One case is lambda and the other case is 1 minus lambda because that difference is there in omega. So we are writing the eigenvectors in the columns of the matrices. They are not eigenvectors. They are just vectors. Not every vector is an eigenvector in quantum mechanics. Huh? So they are just vectors. If you want to, you can diagonalize some of the operator. If you want to do that. Okay. So, I will uh, tell you this strange thing that happens with entropy. Okay. Then I will. Uh, I started around 410 or something like that. So I will definitely want to finish at 510. Uh, this. So in the rest of the thing I will collapse and there are questions <coughs> I can answer. So I want to look at entropy. This is a, one of the highlights of our own work. The two highlights we can, I was trying to tell you is one is this and the second is identical particles. Okay. But I will do this entropy thing. Here. Yeah. The normal thing is classically the entropy is defined by this. Rho is a density matrix. The classical ent uh, entropy is defined by minus dq dp rho of qp log rho of qp. So rho is your probability distribution. Fine. In quantum mechanics also the four normal entropy is given by this formula. Minus trace trace of the integral, integral is replaced by the trace in right like this. But rho is your density matrix or your state. I will come to writing rho as an omega and I will come to that in a minute. But there is a problem. The first problem which I will show you is that if you give me a state, okay, omega, you can write it in terms of a density matrix. Okay. The state I wrote earlier can be written as a density matrix, which I, I give it as an exercise. But there are many ways of doing it. So you can write this omega as row 1, row 2, row 3. There are a lot of ways of doing it. I will tell you why. But if you compute the entropy, the entropy associated to this different ways of writing the state are different. Okay. This density, different density matrices give you different uh, entropies. So what do you do? Entropy does not seem to have a unique meaning. This brings us to the notion of convex sets. Entropy is a convex set. So, uh, the states are a con density matrices form a convex set. What does it mean? If you take a set of states or a set of density matrices alpha i, and I take a combination of these things with coefficients lambda i, and these lambda i's are all positive and add up to 1, then what you get is again a density matrix or a state. So, convex combinations, this, such combinations are called convex 
such converse combinations of the states is a state. So, so this is how you define W also, the omega also. Omega, uh, omega was a convex set. Omega is an element of a convex set. Yes. And this, in general, for example, what are examples? A simplex, finite dimension, like a triangle. <laughs> it's a con the triangle, will, along with these interior points, is a convex set. Okay. You can write this, any element here, as a linear combination of elements at the two, three corners, with lambda i fulfill in this. Okay. Now, there are, for a, this case, for a, these three points, namely 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, these three points are enough to write any point in, the, in this triangle in this form. Okay. And so they are some, something like a basis in a vector space, but not quite. Okay. This is not a vector space. But these are called extreme points of a convex set. Okay. Any convex set has extreme points. So this, this, and these are extreme points. For the simplex like this. For a qubit, I have the set of states is a ball, is a the block sphere or whatever it is. Here, the ex, any point in the interior can be written in terms of boundary points. So if you take any point in the interior, for example, I can draw a line straight line through them, that will cut the boundary at two points, so I can write the midpoint as the average of the two points. Okay. So the boundary points are the extreme are the extreme points of this convex set. But the cubic case here is very different from here. So give you a point, there are many ways of writing it in terms of boundary points. For example, I can draw the line from here, instead of writing drawing like this, I can draw like this, or I can draw in many other for example, I can draw, take any two points here, take, take his average, take another thing. So I can make another decomposition. I can go on doing this different decompositions as I please. Okay. So there are extreme points here, but it is the decomposition of a state or a density matrix in terms of the extreme points is not unique. There are many, many ways for a single qubit already. Okay. So the this has an uh, unfortunate feature that the entropy that you associate <coughs> to a point in the interior is by no means unique. Okay? It is a conventional dependent thing. There is no meaning, intrinsic meaning to that. So, this expansion is unique is only for what they call simplices. For example, a triangle or a, you know, the, all the simplex triangles. You can draw, uh, what is it? Tetrahedron, and octahedron, there are all these geometrical figures you can draw when you do integration theory. For example, if you do properly, uh, simplicial cohomology, you will find these objects. So, this omega, so, the, so what, what I want to conclude is, that the way of writing a state in terms of extremal states is not unique. So when I replace them with density matrices, I get formally like lambda. So what is the entropy associated with this decomposition? It is minus li lambda i Sir, log lambda i. So if, if I take uh, the point to be uh, center of a circle on the sphere, then the point will be unique, right? Yeah, so even then I don't think it is unique because I can draw many uh, no, I am not uh, talking about lines. I am taking a uh, circle on the the periphery, uh, the circumference, the surface. Uh, surface points are extremal points, so they are unique. Yeah, so I take a circle. Okay, you are considering a grid circle. Yeah, grid circle. And the center of the circle is unique, right? So each point has uh, different circles. No, no. If you take a point in the center, if you here, that is many, many decompositions. Except As the boundary points have only unique decomposition. Any point in the interior I can write in many ways. Because I, whatever you do, you can see, you know, we can draw like this, we draw a line like this, like this, and so on. Yeah, but that point's entropy will be unique. Different. No, no. Decomposition is different. Decomposition is different. Decomposition is not unique. So the entropy you can how do you can calculate the entropy? You write one set decomposition. To write like this, the standard, say, Shannon entropy of this decomposition is minus lambda i log lambda i summation. 
But this decomposition is not unique means this is also non unique. And in fact, it is non unique. Yeah. This feature does not happen in classical uh, probability theory. Okay. No, but for so, the center point, uh, they are also the same problem. Because I can draw diagonals in many ways. And yeah. take, a, take it as the mean value of the two points where it touches the boundary. Yeah, sir, but the ratios will be always same. It doesn't matter. The, these objects are different. Also, I can do other things. I don't have to draw diagonals. I can take two points on the boundary, draw a line, take his average in the middle, and draw another line. Yeah. So I'll get another decomposition. So they will go on changing like that. So if we if we take a square, then again this kind of problem will come. Square is not a simplex. Yeah, it's not a simplex. But so I don't know what happens. This kind of problem probably will come. Square will have this kind of problem. Yeah. But a triangle. And then the tetrahedron and so forth yeah. won't have this problem. Okay. So the point, point here is yeah. so the entropy I can derive from here by decomposing a decomposing a state is not unique. And if you replace the omega by the rho at the density matrices. If you try writing lambda eight for this object and you try writing down the uh, entropy associated to this row, they will minus tra row, trace of row log row, they will change. It will change depending on the decomposition. So what what do I do? There is no unique entropy. So what is the meaning of entropy people talk about? Okay. Um, there is a lot of literature coming out these days. So we would like to know what the meaning of all this is. So I'll just make one remark. I want to consider an example which uh, when we first found it, we were very surprised. Okay. But it apparently is known to mathematicians, but I was very surprised. I gave you an example of 2 by 2 of the single cubic where the representation is twofold degenerate. So that is like, as an example, let me choose. To, so to, there are two degenerate states. Now, similar thing happens, for example, if I consider quarks as an example. Now, the flavor indices are the lower indices 1, 2, 3, and they act from the left on the quarks. The upper indices are color indices. The, the flavor transformations, like uh, observing, um, I don't know, the pi on degrees of freedom or whatever, does not affect the color degrees of freedom. So I can choose many different bases for this decomposition. I can make a, a flavor X, so I can go to a new basis in color space by making a unitary transformation. This will not change any observation I make on the flavor index because this is simply a unitary transformation and is, it is basis dependent. It just uh, mixes the basis but the use cancel out. Okay. So, this actually is somewhere, if you know, regular representation of a group. This is, uh, you can decompose a, a particular rep representation irreducible in a regular representation occurs as many times as its dimension. So they are degenerate if it is two and so on. But you can decompose into the two identical representations in many different ways by acting on the right, okay? by the commutant of your the group which is acting on the regular representation. Okay. So this is quite similar to that. So let me compute the density matrix. Okay. In a tricky way. So first let me choose the basis for first the first column. You remember the Hilbert space consists of second column being zero. So I choose this basis and Second Hilbert space consider of first column being zero, I choose this basis. Okay. And this one over root lambda and one over, one over square root of one minus lambda is for normalization. So these are also normal. Now I go to a new basis. By simply applying a unitary operator URS acting on this PI of S. So this is acting only on the S index. So it is mixing this objects which are transforming in a similar way, namely 
Yeah, this one and this one, or this one and this one. It doesn't do anything to the first index. So if I, I can choose this new basis and try to write the density matrix I started from beginning, in the beginning. So I can take my row of you. Yeah. Where is it? This is. Okay. Now it's okay. So by choosing a different basis, I get a different decomposition of my Hilbert space, and I will write my density matrix which I wrote at the very beginning as omega as in terms of this new decomposition depending on the lambda r but in the rotated basis. So, uh, I am trying to see whether I could say it in a... Yeah. Where, is it? Where did they write the formula for... Ah, it is here. It Lambda 1 of u, row of 1 of, what is row 1? Yeah, I got it. So the original row I wrote for u equal to 1, corresponded to u equal to 1 here, which I call lambda 1, lambda, and u, when it u equal to 1 and r equal to 2, I call it as 1 minus lambda, and when u is 1, that is a starting density matrix, which is lambda times row 1, which is this object, for u equal to 1, and uh, 1 minus lambda times row 2 for u equal to 1. You can check that this is the case. When I go to the new basis, I get a new decomposition, which is uh, lambda r of u, the rotator object, rho of r of u, summation r. Okay. For u equal to 1, the original one, now the, the rho I am writing look, is looking different because I have made a different decomposition. Okay. This is simply unity transformation, and because of this nothing will change. Now, something will change, but it, what will not change is the probability amplitude. Now you can calculate lambda r u. I have left out the steps, but it is an interesting fact that lambda r of u is this u of this new basis obtained by unitary, unitary matrix acting on the basis. So if you calculate it, lambda r of u is u r s squared times lambda s at 1. Okay. So this object here is multiplying lambda s 1, which is for s equal to 1 is it was lambda and s equal to 2 it was 1 minus lambda. So this trs of u lambda is 1. This is small calculation. Now you compute the entropy. Because the, the matrix, rho of u is looking like this, so the entropy is given by minus lambda r u log lambda r u. Okay. By this decomposition, you get lambda s <coughs> minus lambda r u log lambda r u. But it is changing with you. This lambda r u is involved in this object here. So it is changing with you. Okay. So the entropy, even in the 2 bit case, is not unique. Okay. I want to look at this expression a bit more. Maybe uh, if I can communicate how I got this. So I start with the original. Oh, one minute here. I start with the original expression for where was it? Yeah. <coughs> Why is it not changing going? I start with this omega lambda, this is of alpha. This is what I call now rho, rho, rho 1. You lambda alpha 1 1 plus 1 minus lambda alpha 2. Okay. Start with this. For the, for the, this is my starting omega, which I can call as in this expression. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. 
in this expression, this thing here for u equal to 1 reduces to the original density matrix. Okay? So this is what for u equal to 1 is the original density matrix. Okay? Now I make a do new decomposition and it looks the same thing but except that you get the rotated lambdas. So you have to take the original list, you have to take the original state of the algebra and decompose it in this new basis. Okay? So when you do that, you get lambda r of u, which is given by this expression here. Well, this u r s squared is what I call t r s of u lambda s of u. Okay? So the entropy has changed. I want to study this change of the entropy. Okay? This expression is very important, and I'll tell you why. Why it is important. So the basic fact is that even for one cubic, a given state of the omega of can have many expansions okay, and many density matrices, so many von Neumann entropies. So, so you can do many von Neumann entropies here. So, so now I want to look at this lambda r of u, which is T r s of u can lambda s at one. Okay. Now notice that this T r s of u has a property that it is non-negative. And furthermore, if I sum it on R, it is 1. Because the U is unitary, when I sum it on R, okay, I'm summing it on, this is the sum of columns of R, TRS, this is a unitary matrix, so it is 1. So when I sum it on lambda uh, R here, I get 1, as it, I should, and these are all non-negative. Okay. It also is 1 when I sum it on S. So this uh, object T is sometimes called a doubly stochastic matrix. See. So T is a stochastic matrix, but it's called a doubly stochastic matrix. See. Uh, the inverse of T, I don't have a black book, is not a stochastic matrix. So it, it creates an irreversible process. So uh, okay. So, I'll give you a theorem. The theorem is under a stochastic map, namely lambda. So, I might have many terms in the expansion, and I'm multiplying it by this t. It's a stochastic map. It is the t matrix elements of t are non negative, and sum over, sum over either index is 1. Okay. It's a stochastic matrix. The entropy increases. This is a theorem. Okay. Oh, how does that happen? Well, the reason is that this S of lambda is sum of S of lambda i, where S of lambda i are minus lambda i log lambda i. Okay. And S double prime of lambda is negative, the lambda between 0 and 1. So it is a concave function. What does it mean? If I, suppose I take one of them and plot it against lambda between 0 and 1, the concave function will look like this. Okay. The straight line joining the uh, beginning point and the end point is therefore always below the below the <coughs> average value at any point here is always below the actual value. This is a characteristic of concave functions. So because of this, you can be easily prove, because the time is up, I will not show you the calculation. You can easily prove, very uh, easy indeed to prove, uh, that <coughs> S of t lambda, namely the entropy at the actual point here, is larger than or equal to this object, where this is the average value, sum is, which r it is average value in between here. But there is a summation on r, but TRS summation on r is 1, so this goes away and you get this is the actual entropy. So let me say again, for a concave function, the value of the function here is always exceeding the mean value along the line, a straight line, and because of this, S of t lambda is larger than or equal to this object here, where there is a summation on S, not so on R. When a summation on R, this gives you 1, and you get S, by S lambda. So you get S of t lambda after the stochastic process, where this u is larger than or equal to the original value of S of lambda. Okay. So, what did I do? I just chose, the, chose a new basis for the Hilbert space and I compute the entropy, it will necessarily increase. Okay. So, if you go on uh, choosing, uh, replicating this decomposition again and again, it will go on increasing and increasing and increasing and 
it is a kinematical thing. Yeah. It's purely the fact that we are dealing with a concave function. Okay. And for those of you who do quantum information, we have now proved that this activity is in fact what they call a, a quantum operation. Okay. It is a you know, unit preserving completely positive map. Okay. You can also prove that. So it will go on increasing, there is no kinematic here. How fast it is going, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, dynamic, can dynamics do it? Well, if you evolve this U as a some object which gradually moves the system from one ground state to another ground state, fine, it will, that's okay. It can move it even faster, but can, that's okay. The entropy will increase. Okay. So this is a characteristic pro process of entropy, and it seems to me that this suggests a second law. Maybe. Okay. So I'll try to complete immediately. I just want to tell you that uh, there is a long-standing problem. I'll tell the problem. Uh, I will not go into the details because of the time. Okay. Entanglement is often studied by partial trace. Okay. For example, this is some of I think you know what is the entanglement. So this is an entangled state. And if you want to compute the entropy, you take the partial tra trace, like get the density matrix and compute the entropy. What this means is that we observe only the system A. We look only at operators of the form K tensor 1. Okay. Because if I look at operators of the form K tensor 1, and they take the trace of rho on that, you find that the one, because of the one here, this <coughs> object reduces to the trace of rho A on K tensor 1, or where this K, rho A is just this original operator here. Okay. So this is, partial tracing is equivalent to restricting to a partial observation. Now, what I want to tell you is that in the literature, there is a lot of papers <coughs> Uh, which deal with fermions, then identical internal coloring or flavoring, <coughs> and you look, look at the basis of fermions, so the wave functions are anti symmetric. Okay. Now, people do partial tracing. It appears to me that this is simply wrong. You always get log 2. Okay. If you take the simplest thing, you get log 2. Okay. It doesn't say anything about the nature of this object. But partial tracing is wrong. Why? Because partial tracing is equal to restriction, but that restriction to operate is like this. But this operator is not symmetric in the two particles. K tensor 1 is not symmetric in the two Hilbert spaces. So this is not an observable. You cannot see such an operator for identical particles. So you should not do that. Okay. You should take an, uh, uh, an algebra which is observable, which is symmetric in the two systems, and which is describing the single particle observables in the two particle uh, anti-symmetric state. So you can f do that. Okay. For example, this of u is a single particle observable. u tensor u is a uh, single particle observable on the two particle state. It is symmetric and you can prove quite rigorously that this is the correct operator to look for. Okay. So if you take the two particle Hilbert space restricted to this algebra, well, first thing that happens is wherever where you are getting log 2, you get 0, yeah. which is good. Okay. You, you don't get to do any manipulation, you get 0. Okay. Then we also look at what happens. Okay. I will. I don't want to make you stay here. What happens if I look at uh, two particle states? Okay. For example, uh, with three internal indices, and I look at uh, op algebra is only living in the one corner. Okay, so the single particle op. So I have a uh, particle with three internal indices, anti fermion with three internal indices, and I look at only operators sitting at one <coughs> corner. So I look at only operators touching one and two, and I take a state which is like this. Okay, it's some psi theta. So the psi theta is at <coughs> yeah. So I take EI, which is the single particle wave functions, take the anti-symmetric product, okay. Then that gives me three two particle states, and I look at this 
particular wave function corresponding to a two particle state in the corresponding density matrix. Okay. And I take this object and restrict it to this algebra, we do the calculation and you find some complicated expression and it is not log 2. If you do live trace, you get log 2. You don't get log 2. Okay. Now, if you put something here also, you get 0. You don't get, which uh, is quite reasonable. So, it, this uh, notion of restriction of observ observations works consistently and seems to be the correct solution for the notion of identical particles. Okay. I think that the, I exceeded the time, so I will stop here. I have some stuff on density matrices. And, uh, okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. If I went too fast uh, towards the end, I apologize. I will answer any questions here. So, any questions or comments? So, as you have said that uh, this entropy depends on the decomposition, but in quantum information theory, what we have learned that is, uh, if given the density matrix, take the uh, spectral decomposition and the spectral value minus log uh, lambda i r spectral value, then minus lambda i log lambda i sum over i, that is the entropy and that is not dependent on this decomposition. But here no, no, it depends on the density matrix. Yeah, but not depends on the decomposition of the density matrix in terms of pure state. No, but the, the point is not the point. What is intrinsically de defined is not the density matrix. It is a state. Yes. So if I give you, you give me one density matrix. I talk to Fedel and create, create another density matrix. Their trace with any observable are they are exactly the same. You cannot, uh, all that you can give me are the mean values of observables using your density matrix. You give me, then I try to reconstruct your density matrix from that observation. There is no guarantee I'll get your answer. I may get another density matrix. They compute the entropy. It should not be yours. Yes? Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, what you have said that this decomposition is not unique. I can take any. Uh, yeah. But if you impose the orthogonality, then it will be unique. Or, or, so that is why I gave a decomposition. Is the Orthogonality, okay, there are several things. One is that if you do, uh, in the abstract way, the, there is no orthogonality between states. The states are not elements of a Hilbert space. Okay. So there is no, but if you try to re write them in terms of density matrices, you can make choose orthogonal density matrices, but the mapping between states and density matrices is not, is not unique. Even orthogonal density matrices it's not unique. Okay? So there is a problem there. So, for example, in the example I gave, where I did the decomposition between, when there is degeneracy between one decomposition and another decomposition, in either case, the density matrices were, were orthogonal. But when I calculate the entropy, they are different. Okay. But this uh, expression of entropy, if we take the entropy, the definition of entropy as minus rho trace log rho. Uh, then trace of rho log rho, then this uh, sum over lambda i log lambda i term, it depends on the orthogonality of the... Uh, of course, but it also depends on the choice of rho. Uh, yes, of course, but if we impose orthogonality, then you don't know lambda i's are in... No, it's not right. Uh, the orthogonality comes if you have uh, lambda i rho i. Okay. Okay, you give me lambda i rho i, just you call rho. What is intrinsic is not that object. What is intrinsic is the, is the mean value of any observation for that rho. If you give me experimentally, you will give me the mean value of, of, of such an observables in that rho. You will give me a table that if I measure energy this much I get. If I measure charge I get, I get this much and so on. You will give it to me. Yeah, so that will depend on a... Uh, on a rotation, a phase term. No, you, you, you give me only that information. Okay. I'll try to reconstruct your row. Yeah. I will not get a unique value for yes, row. Course, but then I'll get a different entropy. That will, uh, no, no, but that will only depend on the, it will be non-unique, only in terms of the, of a phase factor, right? No, no, it no. It will be a rotation. No. That's what I was showing. 
But if, if, if you give this decomposition or that decomposition of the same density matrix, all the all the observable expectation value will be same. Yeah. So there okay. is no difference. There is no difference. So, so that is the point. I mean, there is a factor of a phase factor will come. So that will not change the input. It's not the phase. It's not a phase here. Rho itself, as an it, as an element of the Hilbert space, is changed. So it's ex if you choose to write rho as an operator in the Hilbert space, which is what you are trying to do, a state is not generally an operator in the Hilbert space. In infinite dimensional case, it is not. Okay? Uh, it's not always. Okay? Then what will happen is that if you choose to write it as an operator in the Hilbert space, that mapping from a state to an operator is not unique. Not by a phase, it is simply not unique. Okay. Except in what are people call as simplices. So the, the entropy also changes. And the change is always by a stochastic, stochastic evolution. Uh, so that is a strange thing. Why stochasticity is coming into this picture? Which is what you want for entropy increase is coming naturally into this picture. That appears to be an intrinsic property of concave functions. Minus trace rho log rho is a concave function. And that is what is uh, making this behavior. Okay, so if there is no any further questions, I thank the speaker again.